So this is my dad here. I've got a laser that's probably telling me. Yeah, I like that. Um, he, was a, he was an amazing man. And this is the picture that I always point out. Not these two, because I was a chad. <laughs> <laughs> and there they uh, <laughs> Um, so my dad was 40 here, and he died when he was 45, so it's five years um, later, and again, you just kind of see that smile, um, as we always say, you know, depression has no face. Well, I, I strongly believe my dad was extremely depressed at that time, but we just didn't see it, because, you know, he was very good at wearing that smile. He was someone that I always said had everything on paper, and the fact that my dad was a, a full-time engineer, he had a part-time physiotherapy business that he ran from home. When I was about 10 or 11, he went to adult college and he studied psychology and he got a psychology degree. He read self-help books, he meditated, he ran, he was healthy. Everything seemed to be perfect. Everything seemed to be okay. And um, when I was 18, I came home one day and my dad was broken. My dad was a broken man in, in the fact that all of his behaviors had changed. Um, his eyes were glazed over, they were very distant. He was extremely sad and upset, and he was saying things that we didn't really understand. Um, me and my dad were always very close. We always hugged. We always sort of said goodnight to each other. We hugged. My dad hugged me that day, and he held me for longer than he's ever held me. But with no signs of mental illness or anything like that, you know, it was just dad's having a bad day. It's as simple as I, I thought it was. My dad went to the doctors the next day. He got some antidepressants. Um, my dad never took paracetamols, he was very holistic, and now he was on antidepressants. A couple, just nice, that's a dog, amazing. <laughs> a, couple of, a couple of days later, my dad went back to um, the doctors and said that he still wasn't uh, feeling well. He got prescribed some more antidepressants. A couple of days later, uh, my dad attempted suicide for the first time. So, from him showing any signs of behavior change, any signs of depression or sadness, to him actually making a serious attempt to end his life, it was about seven days. Um, and my dad was very lucky, and we were very lucky that he, he escaped that attempt. He survived that attempt. And um, he came around and came home about a month later, once he'd recovered. And for me, when he came home, the nightmare was over. We'd escaped this nightmare. We personally as well, and even my dad, blamed it on the medication. So with antidepressants, one of the side effects within the first two weeks is suicidal thoughts. And my dad going from someone who never took any medication to now taking antidepressants, we believed maybe that was the case. Now my dad came home, the nightmare was over, everything seemed to be going back to normal, but then my dad got a lot worse, and my dad ended up um, being sectioned into a mental health unit. Now, he sectioned himself because he felt like he was a threat to himself and also a threat to other people around him. Now, this mental health unit is probably where we were living at the time, I'd say a 10 minute drive, um, but it's behind the hospital that a lot of people go to. Now, I didn't even know this mental health unit existed. It was simply hidden away from all of us. Um, I will never forget as well, and we'll talk about stigma soon, my dad said it's a loony bin, it's where the loonies go, it's where the nutters go, and this was simply what my dad was conditioned to believe. The sort of 10 years on, there my dad was, sitting in this mental health unit, and as a family we'd go and visit him every single day, and that was our first real exposure to mental illness. You know, my dad was there, suffering with depression and suicidal thoughts, sitting there, doing crosswords, you know, keeping himself to himself, but really confided in this ward. He wasn't allowed out of this ward because he was a threat to himself. But at the same time, he was spending time with people that had schizophrenia, bipolar, psychosis, and various different types of mental illness. And every time we went to visit him, it's a scary, scary place to go, and it wasn't a very nice place for him to be in. But my dad stayed in there for a couple of months, and he came out, um, and again, he slowly came out. So he was now released out of the ward, then he could release, go out of the hospital, then he was allowed out on weekends, and now all of a sudden he's allowed home. Now when my dad came home, this was a couple of months after, I again thought the nightmare was over. My dad seemed to be okay. He seemed to be the best that he'd been for that period of time. Um, and there's always one uh, memory that sticks in my mind. I was, I was playing football and uh, my dad, he used to referee, he used to come and watch me every game, he used to be involved with some of the teams that I played for. And just playing football and having my dad on the sideline through all of that was amazing. Because it was almost the weight's been lifted off your shoulders, dad's back, dad's going to get better. Um, and what I didn't know at that time is my dad, was, again, was wearing that mask. My dad was going to watch me play football, coming out for meals with us, you know, trying to see his friends. Everyone thought that everything was okay. 
but his mind was telling him something completely different once again. And it was a Saturday, my dad was the worst I'd ever seen him. Um, I did all that I could and we did all we could to get him back into the mental health unit. He was then released on the Monday um, from the mental health unit. I just started a job, I went to see him, he was at my nan and granddad's at the time. Um, he was sitting there, I was here, and it was the worst I've ever seen him. My dad was saying, I'll never be the same dad again, hopefully you can accept that. Um, you know, just held up on a sofa in a really kind of, you know, place that I've never seen him before. I remember looking at my watch and the time was about 10, half 10 at night. I was, I was exhausted, it had been a six months of in, out, what do we do, how do we get into the hospital, that's not worked, this hasn't worked. And I remember looking at my watch and saying, we've just tried all that we could to get him into the mental health unit and now he's out again. Um, I don't know what to do anymore. And simply I said to myself, you've got work tomorrow, go home, get some sleep, go to work, go see dad tomorrow and you know, everything will be okay. Um, the next day I rung my granddad because he was at my granddad's, how's dad? Yeah, he's okay, he's just in his bedroom. Fine, a couple of hours later, rang him, how's dad? Oh, dad's gone for a walk. And I had this sinking feeling that something's gonna happen. And um, my dad took his own life um, that day. So my dad died on the 4th of March, 2009. And um, the guilt that I carried and the guilt that you carry when you lose someone to suicide just eats away at you. And that day that I saw him the day before um, was the last time I ever saw him. And as you can imagine, any form of grief's hard, but that guilt that I then carried for a long period of time after that. But that was my dad's story. My, my story was simply this. When I was told that it was my dad and my dad had um, died, my dad had ended his life, I cried. I punched my nan and granddad's kitchen counter a couple of times. And then I stopped crying. I put this guard up and I'm done. The emotions have been suppressed. I'm going to a nightclub six days later. I'm drinking every weekend, I'm going out, I'm showing everyone that I'm that man, I'm dealing with my dad's suicide, but actually what I was finding myself doing was driving to work, crying my eyes out, listening to songs that me and my dad used to listen to, walking into work, how is everyone, yeah, great weekend, yeah, it was great, we went to this place, we went to this place. Wearing that mask, getting back in my car, crying all the way home, getting home, putting that mask on, wanting to be brave for my mum, because she's dealing with it as well then burying my head in the pillows, crying myself to sleep so my mum didn't hear me. And essentially that's what happened for a long period of time. And um, this is the thing with mental health, is we feel that we have to wear this mask, we have to be very silent about it. And what I found, you know, two years later, is I was doing exactly what my dad was doing for a long, long period of time. My dad obviously had a lot of emotional pain. He was obviously struggling with his mental health, but he didn't feel like he could talk to anyone. He didn't feel like he could admit to how he was feeling. So all my dad did is he suffered in silence. And then there I am doing exactly the same thing again. And um, what helped me was about two years later, I tried a counselor, I tried a psychiatrist, and then um, Amy, who's um, now my wife, she was my girlfriend at the time, she said, you should go and see this lady called Anne. And um, essentially I had a back problem. And the reason why Amy told me to go and see Anne, because Anne was a holistic therapist, so she offers uh, massage. And, I booked up because Amy has described her as she's weird, she's weird, she's a witch, she knows more about you than you know about yourself. Um, and at 21 I was drawn to this witch for some reason. Um, also she offered a massage and it was a donation as well. And it wasn't one of those funny massages that you're all um, But she, all, all Anne was, I remember she walked in, she's about this high, she was about late sixties at the time. No real qualifications. But all Anne was, was a very compassionate, understanding woman who's been through a lot. And I went in there the first session, I went there for my back, she gave me a massage, she referred me to a chiropractor, I left. The week later I went back and she said, why are you here? And I said, I'm here for my back. And she asked me again and she says, no, why are you really here? And those words cut through me for some reason and she managed to break me. And I said, Something along the lines of my dad took his own life. I don't know how to deal with it. And I cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. And essentially, those emotions that I'd bottled up for two years had all come flooding out. Now, if anyone's ever experienced that in a therapy session, the weight has now been lifted off my shoulders. But at the same time, I'm now very vulnerable. Like, the wound's been exposed. But what do I do with this wound? I feel terrible. I can't stop crying. I can't go out like this because I keep crying. Um, do I put a plaster over it? Or do I try and um, recover <coughs> from this? 
And what Anne was amazing at, she was compassionate, but she also put it down to me. She kind of guided me throughout the last, the next couple of years to start answering those questions about my dad. Start answering the questions about me, how I've dealt with it. Because um, I'll explain in a minute, there's a lot of emotions that come through suicide. And for me, it was the question of why. Like, why did he do it? He had no reason to take his own life. Did he not love us? Was he, was his whole 18 years of me knowing him a complete lie because of how everything changed so quickly? And that question of why just ate away at me and ate away at me. So this is my dad here. I've got a laser, as Brady told me. Yeah, I like that. Um, he, was a, he was an amazing man. And this is the picture that I always point out. Not these two, because I was a chad. <laughs> <laughs> and there they uh, <laughs> Um, so my dad was 40 here, and he died when he was 45, so it's five years um, later. And again, you just kind of see that smile. Um, as we always say, you know, depression has no face. Well, I, I strongly believe my dad was extremely depressed at that time, but we just didn't see it because, you know, he was very good at wearing that smile. Um, this man here is the man that I always point out in this talk because he's my granddad. He's 94 next month. He's an amazing man, even though he's a stubborn old man. Um, and... Essentially, his whole conditioning around mental health, you know, he would never be sat where you are sat today with someone talking about mental health. His whole conditioning around mental health is completely different to what we are being conditioned to believe now. So he went through war, um, and you know, his whole thing was, we, don't need, we didn't have counselors back then, so why do you need counselors now? My dad was an only child, and um, you know, my granddad lost my dad in March, and then we lost my nan in April. So essentially, he lost his only son, his only child and wife within the space of, I believe, it was 29 days. Um, both funerals, I remember just seeing him and just, I was upset, I was upset. And then just looking at him, no tears, no emotion at all. There was one time after my nan's funeral, um, he put a rose on her coffin and he walked off. And I thought, that's it, he's going to break. He turns around, he slaps his leg and goes, come on, let's go to the pub. And then that is my granddad's defense mechanism. That's how he's dealt with his emotions for 94 years. Now he's a little bit older and he's not as well and he has carers, he's getting more emotional. But even my dad's suicide, he never believed it. He just didn't want to admit it. My dad's suicide wasn't a recorded <laughs> suicide, it was an open verdict because my granddad told them that he didn't take his own life. He just didn't want to believe it. Even now he does believe it he still ignores it. It's really suppressing it and not getting on with it. My dad, on the other case, was brought up by my granddad, that stiff upper lip, man up, get on with it. But he was also brought up by my nan, who was very sensitive. So the way my dad brought me and my brother up was, you know, he was said, you can be emotional, you can be sensitive, but, you know, if I had a bad game of football, he'd tell me about it. And he'd always compare it to the way my granddad treated him, if that makes sense. So I think my dad struggled with that. How do I deal with my emotions? And then I have that as well. How do I deal with my emotions? How do I, do I talk about it? Does that make me weak if I talk about how I feel? And we need to really start to tackle this. And essentially, when I was going through this, and, and this is the thing with mental health, you feel very alone. Um, but I found out that you know, these statistics are shocking. Suicide is the biggest killer of men under, <coughs> under 50. Biggest killer of young people. Suicide as well, I'm not singling out women. Suicide amongst 13 to 17 year old girls is increasing a lot at the moment as well. So we really need to start tackling this as a whole, but no men should lie at this question. How many of you are under 50? Put your hands up. There's no lie, it's by the looks of it. Um, the biggest threat to your own life right now is yourself. The biggest threat to your own life is your mind, and it's depression, and it's suicide. Um, how many of you have got kids? Yeah, the biggest threat to our children is themselves. It's their mind, it's mental health, it's depression. The thing that I always kind of point out around this, and I know these statistics are kind of sad, but you know, I always sort of say, if this also shows we're very not alone in this situation. I felt like I was the only one going through suicide bereavement, but really, it's such a, a common thing that a lot of people have to deal with. But also as well, you know, I always say, if this was a physical illness killing more young people than anything, how much attention would it be getting? How much media coverage and resources and support and funding would it be have? You know, when it comes to mental illness, we're still very silent around it. We still brush it under the carpet and it will go away. And really, we need to start being more open about it. So stigma is one of the reasons why we don't talk about it, why we suffer in silence. And there's so many effects of it, you know, not seeking help, feeling very alone, suffering in silence. The, the story that I told you a minute ago of my dad just breaking that day, he didn't just wake up that day and have those thoughts. My dad fought that for a long, 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 long time. 
but he couldn't tell anyone. He couldn't tell us that he was feeling of, of taking his own life, or he couldn't tell my granddad. He couldn't go and tell his work, because what would his work do? Would they fire him? Would he be able to get the promotion if he was honest about how he was feeling? So all he did was suffer in silence. Um, and there's a lot of effects of stigma. And one thing that we all say is it's not sick enough stigma, or essentially with mental health, the way we treat it is you have to get critical before you get any help. <coughs> And as a company, it's amazing to see this because we need to proactively start treating mental health. Earlier intervention, especially as well with, with school children, because all we're doing is we're waiting for someone to get to that crisis point before we give them the help that they need. Like my dad didn't get help because he waited and waited and waited and waited. Then he was at crisis point, so he then went to the doctors. But he only really got therapy and actual help after he tried to kill himself. And he was very lucky to survive that attempt. And I see it over and over and over again, that people have to get to that rock bottom before they get any help. And someone said, it's not my quote, so I'm going to nick it, um, you wouldn't wait for every bone to break in your body before you treated a broken arm. And essentially that's how we treat mental health. We have a little bit of anxiety, we leave it, we leave it, we leave it, we leave it, but essentially it's the same as a physical health condition. It's going to get worse, it's going to get worse if we don't do something about it. Now the stigma um, around it, mental health. If I said to you, mental health, what's the first word that comes to your mind? Someone shout something out. Depression. Depression? Anything else? Calm. Calm? Is there any like positive ones or is it quite negative? Mostly negative? So again, mental health. As soon as you hear the word mental health, so mental health awareness week, oh, that's a week about sadness. Now I have just stood here and poured my whole heart out to you, so it isn't, you know, the most upbeat topic. But what I'll talk about in a minute is normalising the conversation around mental health. We all have mental health, but the stigma has caused us to actually see this as a very negative thing. If we then say physical health, what's the first word that comes to mind? Fitness. Fitness? Like health, gym, guns, six pack. Um, more positive kind of um, descriptions of physical health. So for me, normalising the conversation around mental health is switching it from that very negative, depression, sad, you know, to something a little bit more that we all have it and we should all start to be able to talk about it. If we drop the health and we just say mental, what's the first word that comes to your mind? Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. So again, crazy, you know, I've heard nutter, I've heard lots of, again, negative associations with the word mental. Some people say their children say that it's good. Mental is good. Oh, that's mental. It's a good thing. But mostly, our conditioning is mental. Oh, he's mental. Is that he's crazy. He's got something extremely wrong with him, and he's very different to all of us. So we need to start to break down this stigma um, and normalize the conversation. There's a great statistic, as you said, one in four people suffer with mental health. But I really want to move away from that and actually say it's one in one, because we all have mental health. And when it is one in four, if I'm that one in four, I'm judging myself because you three don't, but I do. And at the same time, I'm looking for the one in four out of us four, who's the one struggling with mental health? But in reality, we all have a mind, we all have mental health, we all have a story, we all have stuff that we have to deal with. And I'm here sharing mine, but I'm sure a lot of you have been through worse, or you've been through other things that you can relate to as well. But we're also so silent about it because we feel like we have to suffer alone. So I believe that it's one in one. I want to give you some practical tips as well. When it comes to your own mental health, prioritizing yourself, um, a lot of the questions I get asked evolve around how can I help someone? How can I help my friends, my coworker? What do I say? What don't I say? But I believe that when you focus on yourself, it's going to help you help others. So the quote of don't set yourself on fire to keep others warm is the fact that we have to put ourselves first before we try and help that person. So I was just saying that this is my seventh time of reliving this story. Um, since Monday, and I've got to do it again tonight, um, tomorrow I'm done, I'm switching off, the weekend I'm switching off, because if I don't look after me, I then can't go on Monday and do another talk. Um, so I have to protect myself first before I can um, continue to share. So when it comes to looking after your own mental health, there's a lot that you can do, and as you've seen, mindfulness, there's so many different practices, but I always think about just a helpful strategy, and, and just choosing one that's very individual to you. So when it comes to helpful strategies, some people call them coping strategies. Again, I think the word coping is very negative because, again, the stigma around it. So helpful strategies. 
Um, for me, what helped me in that time was a little bit of exercise. Nothing major, but just a little bit of exercise started me to get out of that depression um, and start to move forward. Talking again to Anne helped me, and that was a helpful strategy that I still do um, today. But what about you guys? Again, it's very individual. What helps you with your mental health? Someone shout something out. So? Food. Food? I thought Brady said alcohol then. <laughs> Anything else? Food? Music? Music? Yeah. Does anyone like exercise? How many of you, um, how many of you use uh, meditation or mindfulness? Put your hands up. How many of you have tried meditation or mindfulness and you thought that it was terrible? Or you just, you just didn't get on with it, yeah? You just thought, oh, this really isn't for me. Um, so again, this is the whole thing with health and strategies, is there's so many out there, but everyone is different, everyone's individual. So what helped me might not help you, and what helps you might not help someone else. You have to, for me, I always say try as much as you can, see what works for you, and then just do more of that. And I always kind of say, have your non-negotiable. So self-care is a very cool word at the moment, but your non-negotiable is something that you do every single day, or as often as you can. So for me, this weekend, I'm completely honest, I was in quite a rough headspace, and then I'm questioning myself, I thought I was over this, why has this come back, why has this come back? Um, but what got me out of it was I went for a, a short little run, and it sounds so silly, but going for that run, then I come home and I felt a little bit better. Whereas before, when I was in that really deep, dark depression, I didn't know any of these helped, so I just didn't do any of them. So it's finding that one thing that helps you and then using it whenever you feel like you need to. Also as well, like I said, it's very individual. Um, there was an article about puzzles, about how puzzles help your anxiety and stress. And the story that I always share is um, we bought a thousand piece puzzle, me and my wife, and we sat down together. I don't know, we're 29, we shouldn't really be doing puzzles. <laughs> We've got kids, so that's probably why. Um, we sat down together and within about five minutes... I was stressed, I was angry, <laughs> I was anxious, because I couldn't find the next piece. Um, so I hate puzzles of that size. An eight-piece Peppa Pig puzzle is, is a breeze, that's fine. But Amy, on the other hand, my wife, she literally sat there for hours, present, like, you know, just completely there, doing this puzzle, and you could just see her whole sort of mental health changing by her doing this puzzle. She was silent, which is amazing, for a couple of hours. I bought her another one. Um, but in all honesty, the puzzles for her help, but puzzles for me don't help. And, you know, meditation helps some people. Meditation just, you know, people can't seem to get on with it. So you have to find what works for you. Therapy is the other one. Um, sometimes I, w I went to a counsellor. It didn't work for me. I was literally waiting for her to solve my problems. Um, but again, counselling, therapy... There's so many different options out there, CBT, hypnotherapy, you know, there's so many different ones. You have to keep trying. Don't go to a counsellor, you don't get on with it, and you write off therapy altogether. Try a different therapist, a different counsellor. In America as well, therapy is cool at the moment. Everyone talks about the therapist, but, you know, in the UK we're still very silent about it. So other things to consider is protecting your own mental health when someone's struggling, looking after yourself. <laughs> Um, again, I didn't really do that well over my dad's depression. I was just wanting to get him better, so I wasn't really looking after myself. Um, maybe I would have made a better judgment. And again, I don't think it would have changed anything on that evening if I was looking after myself. But I wasn't. I was tired. I was drunk. Um, we all have mental health. If we talk about it, it doesn't make us weak. And again, we're all looking for that quick fix. But with anything, physical health, mental health, it does take um, time. So moving on now into an employee's mental health, you can kind of um, scrap that and you can put family member, friend, whatever. This works for anyone that you come into contact with. Now, essentially, everyone kind of overcomplicates it because they fear that they can't talk to someone. What do they say? Are they going to say something wrong? But I always kind of follow the, the situation of ask, listen, and signpost. So ask, listen, support. Now, the issue that you have with mental health is a lot of people don't ask. Okay, so a lot of us don't feel like we're qualified enough to ask. So if I see someone struggling with their mental health, I don't feel like I'm qualified. I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychiatrist. I can't ask that person if they're okay, because what if they start telling me all of these um, scenarios that they've got going on in their mind? I, I don't know how to deal with that. So that's not my responsibility. So I'm going to walk away, and I'm going to let someone else ask who's qualified. Okay? So a lot of people don't ask because we don't feel like we're qualified enough to do so. At the same time, 
a lot of us at this stage, when we actually ask and we listen, we then believe that we have to become their therapist and we have to cure every single problem that they're telling us. Again, that's not our responsibility. We don't have to cure their problems. We're listening and then we're signposting to the right place. I'll break it down for you in a minute, but the, the, the example that I always use is if someone here, right there, had broken their leg and they were in clear discomfort, rolling around the ground, oh, I've broken my leg, I've broken my leg. How many of you would walk past them and ignore them? Would any of you do that? Some of you, which are rude. 90% of you probably would go up to that person, oh, is everything okay? Yeah, you just ask them a question. Or um, you'd stay with them and you'd listen to them. They'd be telling you, I think I've broken my leg, I think I've broken my leg. You wouldn't walk away. At the same time, how many of you would feel comfortable to operate on that broken leg? No, you wouldn't even dare operate on that broken leg. So what you do is you signpost to the experts, you ring an ambulance, you get them in the ambulance, and you get them to the support that they need. It's pretty much the same with mental health. Of course, it's very different, but we ask, we listen, we signpost. So when it comes to asking, it's all about noticing behavior changes. So it can be very subtle. Maybe they're withdrawing themselves from social situations. Maybe it's coming into work late. Maybe it's you know, behavior changes that you might spot. If you're spending time with them every single day at work, you might be able to notice these behavior changes. If it's a family member, you might be able to as well. My dad's behavior change at the beginning was drastic. It was literally from going to work every day, running, seeming like everything was okay, to sad and suicidal. It was so drastic that it was shocking and we still didn't know what to do. There was a more subtle behavior change when my dad was in the mental health unit. My dad was in the mental health unit, he went from extremely suicidal and sad to actually, I feel better, I need to be with my family, my family are going to make me feel better. Now again, that's his mind's way of saying, get out of this mental health unit so you can take your own life. And essentially going from that sad to happy was still a behaviour change that's harder to spot, but it was still a behaviour change that they should have noticed. Um, so it can be smaller behaviour changes, but that's the key. Always look for behaviour changes. If you notice a behaviour change as well, you can also confide with HR or someone like that. Get someone else involved. I've noticed um, so-and-so is coming into work late. Um, has anyone else noticed it? And confide in other members of, of, of the team. Don't overcomplicate it when you ask them. Ask them, are you okay? Is everything okay? How are you? There's this big thing that a lot of people say now about asking twice. Because if I said to you, how are you? What would you say? Fine, thanks. Yeah, I'm fine. Or the other one, I always say, how's your weekend? It was good, it was all right, yeah? You never ever really talk about the details of the weekend. Or if I say, how are you? You never then start sharing um, how you've been. So what Anne did is, why are you here? I'm here for my back. Defense, straight up, I'm here for my back. I don't want to talk about this, I don't feel safe. And then she said, no, 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 why are you really here? And before that, she'd shared a little bit about her story as well, and I felt safe to open up to her. So her asking twice in that situation got me to tell her how I felt, and it was the release that I needed. So don't be afraid of asking twice. So it could be, um, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Or it's just we've noticed you've been coming into work late over the last couple of weeks, and we just want to make sure that everything's all right. Okay? Now, they still might not open up, but you've asked twice. You've put it in different context, and now they might share how they're feeling. Compassion is so important when it comes to asking them. Show compassion um, around it and understand it if you can. And be okay with vulnerability. I'll touch on this at the end, but whenever I do a talk and I'm very vulnerable, people feel like they can, they're, they're safe to share back. Um, and again, I think if you can be okay with vulnerability at the beginning, then other people may feel like they can share too. So sometimes in a company, if a manager shares their story about what they've been struggling with, the person below them can actually then feel safe to share their story too. So once we've asked them, it's then all about listening, 100% listening, Zero judgments, avoid interrupting, don't keep coming in with solutions, and be aware of um, body language as well. Now, when I come to zero judgments, we all have different stress levels. And what I mean by that is, you know, there was a, a guy in a finance firm, he was 55 and he was German, and he didn't believe in mental health. Um, and he said, there was a situation about someone was stressed about moving home. And his answer was, why are you stressed about moving home? Moving home isn't stressful at all. So if someone's sharing to him as a manager about how they're really anxious and sad about moving home, his mind's going to be judging them straight away. Why are you stressed about that? There's no reason to be stressed about that. He's judging them. He's not going to want to listen. He's not going to want to support them because his mind's telling them to judge them. So you have to have zero judgments around this um, and also avoid interrupting too. 
So looking back on it, and again, I don't blame myself now because I wasn't educated on any of this. I did this extremely wrong with my dad because what I was trying to do with my dad was fix him through solutions, not fix him through support. So what I mean by that is I was like, Dad, you've got no reason to be depressed. Come on, let's go for a run. Or Dad, you know, let's go out for a walk. Dad, let's go and watch the football. Dad, let's go for a drink. All of these kind of you know, situations where I was going, you've got no reason to be depressed. Come on, let's get going. My dad didn't need to hear that. My dad probably needed to hear a bit of compassion. Even though I didn't understand it, maybe me telling him that I'm there for him whenever he needed me. Or you know, I was there to support him whenever he needed me to. It's very natural for us to want to fix them because we want them to get better. But really, all we can do is support them through compassion, understanding, and, and show them love and support. Also, at this time as well, by the time they've spoken to you, a lot of the work's been done. Honestly, a lot of the work's been done because this is something they've suppressed for so long, and now someone's asked them, and now they feel safe to share it. The emotions are coming out. The, the, the stuff that they've been bottling up is coming out. They already start to feel a lot better. So by this time, you've already done a lot of the work. And then essentially, this is where your responsibility ends. It's offering them support, telling them that you'll be there for them, but at the same time, remembering your role isn't the therapist. Saying, you know, internal support, we've got HR, I know you've got mental health first aiders, I know you've got um, an EAP, I know you've got a lot of internal support as well that you can refer them to. You've also got professional support. You've got, you know, 999, you've got the doctors, you've got Samaritans, you've got a hotline called Calm, you've got Papyrus, another hotline. There's a lot of different um, professional support out there too. And also as well, if in crisis, if it is a situation where it is in crisis, the only issue is to keep them safe. That's all you can do. You can keep them safe, and that's it. And the story that I always share around that is with my dad. Um, my dad went for a walk. This was about two months before he ended his life. And um, his friend, who he used to run with, saw him, pulled up, spoke to him, got him in the car, and dropped him home. Now, at that time, we thought nothing of it. And it was only until about four months ago I realized that conversation and that stopping him saved his life on that day. So that friend kept him safe on that day. My dad was walking, thinking about doing what he was going to do. His friend stopped him, got him out of that headspace and gave him another day to fight those battles. Now, in my dad's situation, it didn't work out, but he gave him two months of fighting, two months of fighting to continue to try and live. And this is a thing with suicide that we have to understand. People that take their own lives, they don't want to die, they just don't know how to live anymore. They don't know how to deal with that mental pain that's, that's torturing them. And if in crisis, our only responsibility is to keep them safe there and then. That's all we can do. We can't do anything after that. And we have to remember that every conversation, every situation is very, very different. Everyone is different. Every situation is different. There's no one question that you can ask someone that's going to get them to open up to you. Everyone relates to people very, very differently. So essentially, this here is another great tool that you can use called Hub of Hope. It's run by a charity. Um, it's a mental health directory. It works on location. So simply, you can put in this location, and it will show you all of the mental health services around this area um, that you can signpost to as well. Um, Samaritans, it links to it links to a 24/7 support <coughs> crisis line as well. So there's a lot more signposting out there now for you, because how many of you just quickly put your hands up? How many of you feel like you would trust yourself to know what to do if someone was really, really struggling with mental health? Couple, yeah? So a lot of us wouldn't really trust ourselves. So a lot of this comes down to this trust. If we knew exactly what we would do, we have more trust in asking and intervening in that situation. <coughs> so in terms of what helped me, just want to recap. So what kind of helped me? So it's been 10 years since um, my dad's suicide. And like I said, I didn't tell anyone for two years. It took me eight years to then write a blog post on it, um, which then turned into sharing stuff on social media, which then shared into me talking like I am here today. So it took me a long time, like 10 years, to be able to get here. And even though I felt like I was over it, you're never over it. There's still days that I battle with it. Like I said, his 10 year anniversary come up, I was like, I'm over it, it's fine, it's 10 years now, I can talk about it in front of everyone. I was a mess. And I don't know what it was, but it all come creeping back on me again. And, but in terms of what helped me is knowing that I can talk about it, knowing that I don't have to suppress it, I don't have to just put that mask on and, and pretend that I'm okay. I can talk about it, answering and accepting why. So that question of why kept me alive. I answered a lot of those questions in the fact that I knew that my dad had complete tunnel vision. He saw no meaning in his life, even though he had a lot of meaning in his life. The only thing he saw was, do I continue to live in this pain or do I end it? At the same time, one of my big things is my dad. Um, did my dad not love me? For a good two years, 
I felt my dad didn't love me. But I also now know my dad felt like he was a burden. He felt like he was a burden to all of us. He loved us. He always loved us. But in that situation, you feel like you're a burden. So I started to answer those questions. And being in that depressed place as well myself, I then started to understand it. But I also had to accept I will never know why. I will never know why my dad took his life. I will never know the mindset he was in, the thoughts that were coming through his head, the exact reason why he took his own life. And until I could accept that, and it still is hard to accept, I couldn't move forward. So we have to answer and accept why if we lose someone to suicide. Adversity is strength. Everything that we've been through, I highly, highly believe that that actually builds resilience. And resilience is a key word in the workplace at the moment. But I think, you know, all of those things that we've had to endure, that builds resilience. And don't let this adversity make you feel weak. Let it make you feel strong. And the same thing with vulnerability. Um, vulnerability for me is strength. If you can share how you're feeling, it's strong. It's not a weakness in any way. Being grateful helped me. Um, this is a bit spiritual. Anne was a bit spiritual. But she said um, one thing that stuck with me, and it took me a while to get there. But when I was in that dark place, it was very much, I will not get married without my dad. I will not move forward without my dad. I cannot do this without my dad. Why has this happened to me? Why has this happened to us? In that mindset, you're only going to get lower and lower and lower and lower. And that's what I was doing. And what Anne helped me understand was I am so lucky that I had an amazing dad for 18 years. A lot of people don't have that. And I had this amazing father figure, this amazing dad that helped me, and my mum as well, my brother, and my whole family. And shifting from why has this happened to actually, it's horrible, but at the same time, I'm very grateful that I had that. A lot of people don't have that, and I have to put it into the bigger perspective and also know people are going through a lot worse too. And then finally as well, my dad wants me to be happy. When I became a dad, um, all I want for my kids is them to be happy. That's all I want. I want to protect them and I want them to be happy. So even though my dad took his own life, I know that my dad wants me to be happy. He doesn't want me to be sad. He doesn't want me to um, continuously beat myself up over what I could have done. He wants me to be happy. And all of this kind of helped me move forward. And hopefully as well, maybe that can help you move forward if you have a, um, experienced it too. Oh, Brady, what's happening, man? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here we go. Oh, oh. Right. So the final point that I want to make is um, this. We all have to take off that mask. Yeah, we all have to take off that mask, embrace vulnerability, and at the same time, um, know that it's okay to talk. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't walk around doing this all the time and sharing my story with every person. I like watching football. I like drinking beer. I'm quite a normal person. Um, normal. But at the same time, what helps me is knowing that I can talk about it. Does that make sense? Like, I have my escapism. I have you know, what I like to do, but what's freeing for me is knowing that I can talk about how I'm feeling. It's not using that as a distraction, it's doing it because I want to do it, but at the same time, if I am feeling down, I can talk about it. I don't feel like I'm weak for, for being able to talk about it. And this is something that I always say, struggling with mental health is tiring, but struggling with mental health and pretending that everything's okay is exhausting. Like, it's hard to struggle with mental health, but when you're struggling and you're wearing that mask, and you're pretending everything's perfect, and you're saying, I'm fine, but really you're not, it's actually more exhausting. So we actually have to be able to understand that it's okay to talk, and everyone has a story, everyone has mental health, and that we can take off that mask as well. And it's so cliche in the mental health space that you aren't alone. Your mind will tell you that you're on your own, but don't feel like you are. You can talk to other people about it. You've got great internal support, so please, you know, don't feel like you have to suffer in silence, because... I strongly believe my dad could still be alive. My dad could still be alive if he didn't suffer in silence, if he knew that he could talk to someone, and if he had that earlier intervention as well. So um, I understand this is quite a heavy session. I want to end it on a lighter note. Um, but honestly, just you know, if we normalise the conversation around it, mental health in a way, the conversations that we need to be having, not making it cool, but making it acceptable every single day. We should be able to talk about it, not once a year on World Mental Health Day, not once a week every single year. It should be something that we talk about every single day if we feel like we need to be able to talk about it. Okay? So, um, does anyone have any questions at all? Hey man. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing such a personal no story so attentively. It's like incredibly powerful for me. I'm sure it is for everyone else. Um, secondly, you, you talked a bit about at the start about how these issues are affecting kids you know, younger and younger now, and you've got a kid yourself. Do you think the principles of what you kind of say here, and everything is brilliant and makes total sense, do you think those principles change for 
younger people? And is there a kind of bottom age that you start to address these kind of things with? Yeah, I think it's a difficult one. So um, again, for me, it's more about like, normalizing it. So um, I got a stepson who's nine. Um, I met him when he was 18 months. And I've got a two-year-old. So the two-year-old's different. The two-year-old just makes a mess and is always ill for some reason. <laughs> um, the nine-year-old now, <laughs> when he was, and I'm always ill as well. Um, the nine-year-old, he, um, when he was about six or seven, you know, he starts to ask a few questions. Um, he knows, but I've never gone into extreme detail about it. I never really talk about diagnosis or anything like that. It's more about if you ever feel like you can talk, if you ever want to talk, talk. Um, he also sees what um, I'm doing. I, I pulled him out of school, I shouldn't have done, but who, who cares. Um, <laughs> pulled him out of school to, to go into Sky News, to do a, a, a feature on Sky News. He come, um, went to the studio, come behind the scenes, met you know, the lady who was doing the interview, and he loved it. But then he went into school the next day and the teacher said, where was you? And he says, I was at Sky News with my dad. And they went, what was he, what was he on there for? And he went, suicide. <laughs> the teacher didn't know how to react. The teacher was literally shocked. And, and none of the kids, even at nine years old, even knew what mental health was still. Um, so for me, it's hard. I, don't, I want to protect them. I don't want them to know all the ins and outs that they are, that they are. But I want them to normalise the conversation. If they feel like they can talk about it, they can. It's a fine line, yeah. Any other questions? I'm sure you can ask anything. Talk about that um, uh, analogy, you had a break from bonus and sort of knowing when things like, it seems like one of the problems in terms of self awareness, like when do you sort of seek help? Because um, I think people just, be like, like in general, might be like, uh, well, I'm not that bad, or it's just kind of like, is there any ways to know when you should? I think as early as possible. So I think if you're already self-aware enough to know that I'm actually not feeling as good as I could be, that could be the time to start proactively trying to improve it. Um, just, yeah, the answer to that question is as early as possible. But again, it, it's trying all of those different coping mechanisms, it's trying all of those different helper strategies. It's not maybe going straight to see a therapist straight away. It might be trying a few things, seeing what works for you. And you mentioned self-awareness. It's that self-awareness to know this works, this doesn't work. And doing more of that to proactively try and stop it from getting better. Yeah, nice. Does that answer your question? Yes. Any others? Do you have um, any advice about how you approach the subject? So that you know, as is older and grown up, you are going to talk about feelings and emotions. How do you go about having that conversation? So that's a good question. So you have to go into it knowing that you cannot control that other person. So what I mean by that is if you went, you asked, you asked again, you tried all this, and they still didn't open up, you cannot do anything about that. All that you can do is know that you've tried to get that person to speak. It's the same with my granddad. My granddad, like I say, he denied that it was suicide. It was his conditioning. He doesn't really know what I do. I think he thinks I'm a drug dealer because he's like, you don't go to work. Um, <laughs> and, so what do you mean you make money on the internet? Um, and he, he literally, if, I, don't know, I don't know, but... If I think if my granddad knew what I'm doing here now, he might judge me for it. And that's purely his conditioning. And I know that I cannot control him um, and his viewpoints on it. So I think you've got to ask, you've got to try. But you've also got to know that it's not down to you if they don't share that. Yeah, so I think if they've, if they've shared to you, like I said, a lot of that work's then been done. You've actually done an amazing thing that they feel comfortable and safe to tell you how they're feeling. But how are you then meant to react? Just listen. 100% listening. Listen, let them talk, let them talk, let them talk. And then have that trust in the back of your mind that you know where to sign those to. So if it was you and you were telling me everything and everything, I would say this can get better. Um, Again, it's entirely up to you, but sometimes, again, showing that compassion of saying, I, I don't understand what you're going through, but I, I know that it can get better, giving them that reassurance. There's a key thing as well when it comes to, so there's a, a you know, mental health first aid and there's something called a CIS, which is suicide first aid. They all focus on hope. 
Like if they're talking and they're talking and they're talking and they give you one little piece of hope, really latch onto that and keep reminding them of that hope that they've got. But then you also then have to trust and have something in place that you know, bring HR in, bring a mental health first aider in, bring, you know, go to Hub of Hope and see if there's any um, directory that you can use as well. Yeah? I think, it's, I think it's more of a constant sort of behaviour. So again, if they're having a bad day, I would still approach the topic, but it doesn't mean that they're not going to be okay the next day. Um, if it's more of a longer term thing, it's the same with Dad. I thought it was six months, Dad was up and down. We were just waiting for him to one day get better, even though he was in that really dark place. Um, so I would say it's more consistency. If it was more consistently, 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 sort of down, 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 then I would start to really try and help them as well. Any others? It's also really hard whenever we do questions because there's so many unanswered questions around mental health stuff. Like it's so under-researched, so underfunded, it's, you know, and we all have to try and figure it out for ourselves. Like none of us here were educated at school about resilience, stress, worries, anxiety, so we're all literally figuring it out ourselves. Um, so hopefully, as we say, the next generation may have a bit of that um, conditioning from them. Any other questions? Though? Any questions about Brady that you want to know? It was good, it was nice, it was funny. It was nice. <laughs> <laughs> we had some good parties, didn't we? Some parties. I was waiting for every hand to go up. <laughs> Um, no more questions? I'll hang around if you guys want to ask any questions individually, but um, I'm pretty active all across um, social media, so if you do want to reach out personally as well, um, please feel free to do so. But um, thank you so much for listening, and please enjoy the rest of your day, and remember that you can talk about how you feel. All right, guys? Thank you.